Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> this is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study, where we have been going through the Bible chapter by chapter and just really experiencing the narrative of the Word of God the way God intended for it to be experienced. If all you've ever been exposed to is topical teaching, then there is something vital of the infallible Word of God that is in a state of deficit in your life. When you study the Scripture in the order that it has been designed by God and handed down to us, going through verse by verse, chapter by chapter, then you gain access to something. You talk about a hidden message it's only hidden because it's neglected that there is an access you get through, people say, well, I know something's missing. What's missing is what Paul told Timothy, give attention to reading. Because when you give attention to reading, you're accessing the marrow of the word of God as he intended for you to appropriate it. And you're not going to get that any other way. You're not going to get that through a topical message. In other words, a topical message is the person gets up and he's preaching on a specific subject and he's taking scriptures from different parts of the Bible. Now that can be inspired, but the inspiration that leads a minister to put together a topical message does not rise to the level of the inspiration that produced the infallible word of God. And in the infallible word of God, if we look beyond the surface, there's also this deeper vein of truth that is implied by the order in which it's given. And so that's why we're going through the Bible chapter by chapter. Oh, I know something's missing. How come we're not experiencing what the Word of God said? Well, it's, it's not rocket science. Let's begin to study the Word in the narrative as the narrative was so arranged by God and handed down for us to access. And then you're not walking off into the pages of the word. The word's walking off into your life. Amen. Because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so then by expositional Bible study, there, there comes over time a protrusion, an extension of God's glory that begins to um, insinuate itself into your life that causes the trajectory of your life to be more what Jesus paid for on the cross. Now, today, today's giving day, I want you to memorize a number, 417-593-9802. 417-593-9802. That's the number for our office. And Katie, Katie Carr, she's there to take your call and to receive your donation. Give into the glory. It's not, it's good to give. You give, there's times that we just give at different times whenever the Lord prompts us. But there's something different and unique about giving when you sense, when you, you're, you're in the presence of God, truth is being communicated and you get that sense, huh, yeah, I feel God on that. That's the time to give. And because of how church gets done, we don't do that. We, we have different parts of the service, and before that unctioned ministry comes forth, we'll receive an offering. I, I think we're falling short of something there. Because the early church knew something about giving into the anointing. They laid the money at the apostles' feet. Mm -hmm. And when they did that, in a time of upheaval, that 911 would have paled. 911 would have been a blip on the screen compared to what was happening in Jerusalem at this time. Mm -hmm. And the early church community was so disconnected from all of that that they were going from house to house, eating their meat with singleness and gladness of heart, and it said not one of them had any debt. Amen. Their debts were discharged. Amen. Their debts were, why? Because they were giving into the glory. The Lord spoke to me about that this morning. We taught about how Jesus said, I have appointed you a kingdom. Well, kings have kingdoms. You're a king. And guess what? Every king has a minister of finance. Do you know you have an angel assigned not just to you, but to the kingdom that Jesus has appointed? Do you understand the kingdom comes with bureaucracy? 
There's a bureaucracy of angels assigned to you, and one of them is the Minister of Finance, like Alan Greenspan. You understand what I'm saying? Sure. He used to be a chairman of the Fed for years and years, controlling what happened in the economy of man. Listen, there is a minister. The angels are there as ministers of those that will be heirs of salvation. They are your ministers. In other words, you are a king and you have ministers. You have a court of angelic functionaries assigned to your life. And one of them is the minister of finance, who, whose job it is, is to cause the economy of the kingdom to begin to usurp the economy of man in your life. The economy of man is about limitation about what you don't have, about the bill that you can't pay. The economy of the kingdom usurps the economy of man. And it's the angelic minister of finance assigned to the king that Jesus has caused you to be because he's appointed you a kingdom, a retinue of bureaucrats, angelic bureaucrats assigned to see that your life is conformed to the pattern of as in heaven, so on earth. Amen. And so open the vaults, folks. Open the vaults of your life and give. Give joyfully. Give willingly. The only money that the angel can deal with is that which is given. If it's given grudgingly, then he can't work with that. That's it's right. dirty money. That's right. God don't want your dirty money. Mm -hmm. He wants that which is given joyfully, willingly, to, sacrificially. To him. Now, to him. now I want you to give. Go to propheticnow.com, click on the donation link, pick up the phone, dial 417-593-2000, uh, 417-593-9802. Katie, Katie's so sweet that people spontaneously go back and put joyful comments on their giving whenever they get an opportunity to do so. The system will ask her. To just say how sweet she was. She's a doll. <laughs> and, and so I want you to call. I want you to be, and give in the anointing. And she got it from her mama. Most of you would know, but Terry Allen is her mama. Is it any wonder they're both dynamite in the ministry with Father's heart? Because they're precious, precious people. Listen, so into the glory. Amen. Because when you sow into the glory, something seminal happens just like when an ovum is... Uh, uh, fertilized in a woman's womb. Mm -hmm. He said that I'll meet all of your needs out of the glory. Uh, every The answer to every need you have is in you, in embryo, in the glory. Amen. And it's the seed that you sow into the glory that causes it to take place, to germinate, to come to life. And it, it's like somebody said, it'll make your baby jump <laughs> down in your belly. And it's going to find its way out into your life. I am looking for a cadre of people. I'm looking for a core of people that are going to connect with that truth and become the kings in the earth to go through this life, not like paupers, but like kings. Amen. Kings and potentates, principalities and powers that are resting from the enemy. Jesus went and got the keys of hell and death. He said, the rest of it's up to you to go get the keys of the economy, the keys for your family, the keys that bring forth breakthrough in your life you, to where what determines what happens next in your life is coming out of the glory and not coming out of your stinking circumstance. That's right. But it begins, the, 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 the ground state, the access to that ground state of glory. Jesus said it over and over again in the very hours before his crucifixion. He's talking to him about money. We got to get that. And that thing in us that doesn't want to get that, that's a demon. That's a demon that inhabits Christianity, and we need to get at, get loose from that and begin to walk in the dominion that God's given us. 417-593-9802. Pick up the phone. Give into the glory. Propheticnow.com. Go to the website. Click on the donation link. There's a, instructions how to mail in your donation. There's instructions in two different ways to give electronically. You can call Katie, 417-593-9802. And give. Give into the glory. Money begins to move by the Spirit Amen. when you give into the glory. Amen. And our giveaway 
this week. If you look at our giveaway, we post this on social media and on the internet. Our giveaway this week is Breaking Stagnation and Walking in Breakthrough. And uh, it's a PDF out of our online store. It's also available on Amazon, but we're giving it away all this month. Uh, this particular PDF is something I wrote in response to a question that was asked me by a desperate person. And when I counseled him, that spirit of counsel, I recrafted that into something that would be a benefit to you. Do you feel like you're in the stuck place? Is your marriage stagnant? Your financial situation stuck? If you want to break things loose and start moving forward in the right direction, breaking stagnation will help you. Uh, we had a lot of response, a lot of really powerful response when this was first written. It's, this is the first time I've given this away. I want you to get it. It's our gift to you through the whole month of May. So today, Luke 23, part one. Our sins take Jesus to Golgotha. In chapter 3, chapter 23, chapter 23, today Jesus is beaten and brutalized, first at the high priest's residence in a previous chapter, then at Pilate's judgment hall, and also by Herod at that vile king's palace. And we can only wince at the brutal violence and the mistreatment Jesus suffers. But the greater truth is that it is our sin and not just Pilate that sends Jesus to the tree. It's a two-part study. Today will be part one. So, Kitty, if you would read Luke 23, verses 1 through 26, that's the entire reading for today. Okay, I like number 26. It's one of my favorite numbers. Okay. And the whole multitude of them arose and led him, Jesus, to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it. Then said Pilate to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. And there were... They were the more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at the time. that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season because he had heard many things of him and he hoped to have seen some miracles done by him isn't that interesting then he questioned with him in many words but he answered him nothing and the chief priests and the scribes stood and vehemently accused him and herod with his men of war set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to pilate and the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were at enmity between themselves. And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people, said unto them, Ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people. And behold, I, have, I having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man, touching those things whereof you accuse him, nor... No, nor yet Herod, for I had sent him to you, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. I will therefore chastise him and release him, for of necessity he must release one unto them at the feast. And they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man, and release to us for rabbits, who for a certain sedition made in the city, and for murder, was cast into prison. Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus, spake again unto them, but they cried, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And he said unto them the third time, Why? What evil hath he done? I have no, found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And they were instant with loud voices, requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. And he released unto them unto them him 
that for sedition and murder was cast into prison, that would be Barabbas, whom they had desired. But he delivered Jesus to their will. The will of man is strong. And as they led him away, they led they laid hold upon one Simon, the Cyrene, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. After apprehending Jesus at Gethsemane, the temple authorities abused and brutalized him at the high priest's residence. He was then whisked off to Pilate's judgment hall in hopes that Pilate would condemn Jesus to death, which the high priest had no authority to carry out themselves. In order to interest Pilate to consider Jesus' case, they attempted to portray him as a disturber of the peace, a rabble rouser against Caesar, a miscreant worthy of capital punishment. Pilate sees through their protestations in political theater, but the suggestion that Jesus might consider himself a king, now that bore further investigation in Pilate's mind. In verse 3, Pilate asks Jesus, are you a king? And Jesus' answer was not typical of what Pilate was used to hearing. Jesus just says, thou sayest it. In another gospel, he says, hey, don't you know I have power to deliver you over to death? And Jesus said, you have no power other than what my father gave you. And something about Jesus' demeanor. I mean, Pilate was used to people groveling in fear. He was used to people standing before him and loosing their bowels. They were so afraid of what he could do with them. And Jesus is just standing there quite calm. And even though he's a little worse for the wear, and he's been beaten and abused by the servants of the high priest and the temple soldiers, and uh, uh, something about Jesus, and perhaps the legend of Jesus had reached Pilate beforehand, and so it disinterested him in capriciously delivering him to death. Same thing, remember Jesus talked about Herod, just grabbed up a handful of men randomly, and exsanguinated them and mixed their blood with his sacrifices. Pilate could kill somebody just for the fun of it. So could Herod. But they're hesitating. Something about Jesus gives them pause. And so Pilate turns to the chief priests and the usual suspects gathered around them, and he said, I don't find any fault in this man. Now, there's no independent record, civil record in Roman history or an independent record outside of scripture that this trial ever took place. Scholars even maintain that they hold this passage in question because it contains or it maintains the character of a narrative that absolves the Romans' Gentile involvement in Jesus' death and particularly impugns the Jews as the main culprits of the affair. It's just like when uh, Mel Gibson put together the uh, Passion of the Christ. It followed the narrative of the Gospels almost word for word, but the one thing that uh, the Jewish uh, people came to Mel Gibson and pressured him to take out where the Jews said, his blood be upon us and upon our children. It's the one thing they took, they, they took out. Jewish sources in the main, they, they cry foul at this account here in Luke 23 because it casts them in such a bad light. For us, in a devotional reading of the passage, we conclude that certainly Jesus came into his own and his own received him not. Even down to this day, if you study Jewish scholarship where they're dialoguing among them, themselves, when they talk to non-Jews, they approach it one way, and they soft-pedal this <laughs> issue. But if you go out to like Kabad.org or other Jewish sources where you see they're interacting among themselves, <clears throat> you will, when they discuss the culpability of Jesus, they'll maintain that it was a fitting punishment that Jesus be executed for what they still believe was simply just a common Galilean's crimes against the ancient Jewish state. They still believe he's worthy of death. My, my. 
And upon hearing Pilate's attempt to exonerate Jesus, the Jews, they're not about to relent. They become violently insistent. One gospel says, if you don't do what we say, you're not Caesar's friend. Uh, they're insistent that Jesus is stirring up the people. Now, are they really concerned about things being peaceful? They were not honest about wanting to maintain what was called the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, uh, because just a few decades later, Jewish authorities would hail a first century revolutionary named Bar Kopa just a few years later. And they declared him, the authorities, the same ones that wanted to see Jesus dead, took another man and declared him to be Messiah, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And they backed him in the overthrow of the Roman occupation. He couldn't keep it up. So 10 years after the revolt, the Romans came back with great force and they dismantled Jewry, expelled the Jews, destroyed Jerusalem and leveled the temple. When Pilate heard that Jesus is a Galilean, he attempts to claim that the jurisdiction is Herod's and sends Jesus away to the palace of this corrupt king who happened to be in Jerusalem at the moment. When Herod sees Jesus, he's very glad and he hopes to see Jesus perform some parlor trick. Perhaps turn water into wine for his party guests or something. And while Jesus did answer Pilate to Herod, he doesn't offer a single word. And notice that the text says, Herod and his soldiers abused Jesus. So Herod himself was not unknown to be one that would get off and get his hands dirty. Mm -hmm. And so Herod and his soldiers uh, brutalized Jesus. Now Herod is a half-Jewish pretender to the throne, who built the Jews this magnificent temple, but he was never fully accepted as their rightful sovereign. Since Jesus would not satisfy Herod's curiosity, he's again abused, Herod laying hands on him himself, and then sent back to Pilate. But here's the cruel joke. He sent him back to Pilate, clothed in his battered body in this gorgeous robe in order to goad Pilate. And Pilate, you got to understand, Pilate is not just there as a somber philosopher ruler. Huh. He, he saw the humor in it. He smiled when he saw Jesus came back beaten again, but wearing this nice, gorgeous royal robe. And because of that, Pilate and Herod, who had been bitter enemies, were fast friends, were best friends after this. I don't know if you've never, ever heard years ago when Mike Warnke shared about the crucifixion of Jesus and what took place. He talked about how after he'd been beaten with many stripes and his back was left open, bleeding and deep cuts in his back, and they put the royal robe, and it, it delighted them, he said, to rip that robe off when it had begun to congeal and just open those sores up again. That was too, too real, too real. And so Pilate convenes, verse 13, the chief priests and the city rulers together again, and he insists that in spite of all their protests against Jesus, he says, I don't find any fault in him. I don't find anything in him worthy of death. And he then offers to further chastise Jesus and to release him and let him go. Now, he was either doing this out of sincerity or because he knew that it would incite them mm -hmm. And he wanted to make sure that the responsibility was not all his. And when he answered to Caesar for his actions this day, he wanted it to appear as though he was quelling unrest in the city. So he was saying things to provoke them. And so, th again, this narrative is strongly objected to by the Jews right down to today, so much so that even Christian textual critics... I'm talking about seminarians, the people that have trained our pastors, those that have been to seminary. These textual critics suggest that these references to Pilate's efforts to free Jesus, well, these were added later because when they examined the grammatical makeup of the text, these references do not fit. They're, in, they're inconsistent with the writing style of the remainder of the document, which they question Luke even existing, and et cetera, et cetera. 
And so remember now that this is the time of the Passover. And it's customary for a convicted felon to be released at this time of celebration. And Pilate's aware of this and he attempts to use that custom to get Jesus released. And, and see, this is the reason the Jews don't like this because it's four times Herod is trying to manipulate the circumstance. And it isn't because he's a good guy. Okay, he, he could have well been doing this just to provoke the Jews so that he didn't have to bear all the responsibility himself. He wanted to make himself look good to his superiors because, look, I did this to quell disturbance. And he wanted it to be a, the more disturbed they were, the better Pilate looked. And because he took great glee in seeing how Herod had abused Jesus, he saw the humor in it. It, it, it was humorous to him to see Jesus uh, mistreated as he was at Herod's palace. So we know he wasn't this good guy, this uh, thoughtful ruler trying to uh, spare Jesus. He wasn't trying to do that, highly unlikely. And uh, the final disgrace for Jesus is just like whenever Judas shows up in the garden, uh, that when, when they go back before that, after the Last Supper, when Jesus says, I'm giving you a kingdom, and and all they want to do is fight about who's the greatest, and then he goes out to pray, and he's trying to wake these guys up, and they won't even pray with him, and then Judas shows up, and that's the end of his discipleship of those men, and now here is the end of Jesus' earthly ministry to the Jews that that ends not with them saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, but ends with them saying, crucify him, cru crucify him. It's the final disgrace of the people that nakedly exposing what's in their hearts when they're crying, crucify him, crucify him, because like Judas, who saw this happen, he was so disappointed he commits suicide. He was trying to provoke Jesus to become the earthly king they wanted him to be, just like the people that wanted to take Jesus by force and make him a king, just like Peter, who rebuked Jesus for talking about crucifixion. They wanted him to be what they wanted him to be. Isn't it interesting that when Jesus comes back after he descended into hell and then he ascended with the many saints seen walking in the streets, he was not revealed to the Jews. He was revealed to those who looked, loved him and look for his appearing. That's what we know about him coming again to be in us, with us, through us for rapture. Now, when they cry crucify him, now Pilate, either in mockery or in truth, he's, a, he's appalled. He said, well, what evil has this man done? He either said that sincerely or he was really trying to go to him. Why? Hmm. What evil? What has he done? Come on, tell me. What has he done? Hmm. Yes! You've uttered the magic words. Okay, you guys, go kill him. Right. So, in, in either whether it was in sincerity or whatever, it's Barabbas that they said they wanted. And the objection is so overwhelming to Pilate suggesting that Jesus be let go that Pilate relents and he sends Jesus out of his judgment hall, beaten, spat upon, scourged and bleeding to be flayed alive and crucified at Golgotha. Jesus is weakened by the abuse of Pilate's soldiers and the beating he took at Herod's palace that instead of carrying the wood for his own crucifixion, a man named Simon is compelled to carry the cross instead. Now, Simon was from a city in what is now eastern Libya. It's known to history that the Jews of Libyan origin were prominent in, in Jerusalem, so much so that they maintained their own synagogue. Hmm. It's like if you go wow. to you go to a certain city, you're gonna you'll see a mosque or you'll see an Eastern Orthodox church or or something. In in other words, they were uh, not of local extraction, but there were so many of them, they had their own place of worship. And apparently Simon was standing by as Jesus is compelled to carry the wood toward his, his execution. And it's believed by some that Simon must have shown some sympathy for Jesus' suffering. And in retaliation, the execution squad 
punishes him by forcing him to take the wood of the cross himself, a clear threat. It's like, okay, well, we'll just take you and crucify you. How about that? Simon didn't know. Turns out they explained it to him. So, okay, well, you carry it. They probably thought they were going to he was going to be crucified himself. Now, Mark 15, 21 identifies Simon as the father of Alexander and Rufus. Christian tradition tells us that in later in the later Christian community established in Rome, that these two sons of Simon were very prominent leaders. Acts 11.20 also talks about Cyrenian believers who were preaching among the Jews in later years, and it is believed that Simon, this same Simon that carried the wood of the cross, is one of the Cyrenian believers mentioned in Acts 11 that were preaching the gospel among the Greeks. Now, this is very interesting because there are very few characters other than the 11 disciples whose lives are tracked from the days when Jesus walked in Jewry to the years following when the early church was established. And it's also interesting that the existence of Simon, people say, well, he didn't really exist. You want to bet? <laughs> because archaeology has discovered the tomb in 1941 of Alexander the son of this very same Simon. So how about that? Son of Simon. Archaeology, <laughs> I subscribe to Biblical Archaeology magazine. Mm -hmm. He likes that. And I love it because you can study archaeology and see points where it confirms the biblical narrative. Now, it's also of note, and you may run into this from time to time, there are those that insist that it was Simon and not Jesus who actually dies upon the cross. They maintain that when Simon was compelled to carry the timber, that it was actually a euphemism in the wording implying that Jesus is allowed to slip away in the crowd after a bribe is paid to the soldiers in the execution squad. And then Jesus went on as they would allege to die a natural death and Dan Brown gets to write um, what was that? The movie oh, uh, with uh, Tom code, Hanks. Some, something about Bible code? No, no, no angels and demons. But and it's the, the one first before one. that, yeah, where they say Jesus got married. Yeah, he, I can't he remember. He married Mary Magdalene, and they had a baby. And the Beringian kings of France, the first line of kings in France, and yakety yakety. <laughs> and uh, you know, and, and people have this. You know, as far as that idea, not that Jesus didn't die, but the idea that Jesus might be married, you know, uh, the those that believe that you have to be celibate to be truly committed to Christ, they say Jesus wouldn't marry because he could not have died for our sins. He would have corrupted himself in a conjugal relationship. Well, that implies that sex is sin. Uh, and of course, in in medieval theology, that was a belief that the forbidden fruit was a sexual relationship. But uh, there's, there's nothing vile, there's nothing inherently evil uh, between a conjugal and a conjugal relationship. Jesus did not uh, marry because he was already betrothed to a bride, and that bride is the bride of Christ. Amen, hallelujah. If you ever read his book, his first book, Russ's Face to Face with the Father, you will, ladies, you will love the chapter on uh, the wedding, the wedding Canaan. in Canaan. Oh my goodness. The wedding at Canaan, we got just a little bit of time. The idea is Jesus grew up and he maintained, it was very likely Jesus was in business uh, before as a carpenter that he did business in Cana. And so we proposed the story of the wedding in Cana at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Mm -hmm. He goes there because he's friends with the family and uh, the little girl that, who had grown up in that house had known Jesus as an older man. And that she's getting married, but she had been sweet on Jesus ever since she was little. Can you imagine being a little girl and you're growing up around Jesus? Probably she first met him maybe when he was in his early 20s. And uh, and can you can you just imagine she thought she was going to grow up and marry Jesus because yes. he was the sweetest man she knew. And so she's kind of heartbroken that, you know, Jesus, when it be she became of age, so goes my story, that she comes of age that that could have happened because Jesus was available, but yet he didn't show an interest in it. Can you imagine mm. you are you have a fantasy as a little girl, not knowing really who Jesus was, and thinking that you'd grow up and marry Jesus, and you're having to marry somebody else, and 
and then Jesus comes to the wedding. And so the mother comes in while she's getting ready to, to have the ceremony. And the mother comes in and she whispers to her, he's here. And her heart, oh, the, her real sweetheart, the one she really wanted. And things go on. Jesus turns the water into wine. And in the midst of everything that's happened, Jesus and the bride have this little conversation as he's leaving. And he can see the wistfulness in her. And he... He hugs her and he says, you've got to understand, I'm betrothed to another. To another. Oh my gosh, and, uh, ladies, you have to get the book if you don't own it now. Face to face just with ask, the father. Yeah, face to face. Just ask Allison when she's on again. Oh my goodness, she couldn't put it down. Go <laughs> to Amazon.com and you can get face to face with powerful. the father there. Very powerful. So they maintained that Simon was actually crucified and not Jesus and you know, in order to not be dumbfounded, some people hear such outlandish claims and just because it's outlandish, they don't know how to answer it. And it'll even put a little doubt in their heart. Uh, but if it arises in conversation, says, yes, I know all about that, but that's just not true. What we do know from the narrative is that Jesus is condemned. His followers are scattered. <laughs> Somebody said, I've never heard a Bible study like this one. Uh, <laughs> Those who cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna, just a few days before are now shrieking, crucify him, crucify him. And Jesus is proceeding along the Via Della Rosa and his body is abused, filthy, bleeding, covered in sweat and spittle. And the sin debt upon him inwardly weighs him down as the wood crushed him outwardly. Mm. Our sins, our sins. That's right. Your sin and my sin marred him as much in his soul as the abuse of the soldiers has torn his body. His soul looked like inwardly, like his body looked like outwardly, and it was your sin and mine that was the scourge. Our sins, our personal sins, we realize, we have to realize that it was our transgression. Listen, it was the sin that originated in Adam that centuries later infected you and I in the moment of our conception. That very sin, you have to see that, not just in the reckoning of God, but that very sin that originated when Adam bowed his knee to Satan. That very sin that then genetically, years later, contaminated us where we were not only conceived to life, but we were conceived with the germ of death from the womb. Before we ever came out of the womb, we came out as condemned men and women, condemned not only to death, but condemned to be marred in our character more in the visage of Satan than in the visage of our creator. That very sin, that we all struggle, that sin we are wrestling with. That's why Paul said, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? When you wrestle with sin, you are wrestling with the creature within you that nailed the nails into his hands and into his feet. He's carrying that. He took it. It, 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 ex it to the point it expired his life upon the tree and he carried it down into the grave. And only in the grave did he transmute that sin when the father said the price is paid and he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave and he came back to liberate you and I from that, that fang, from that infection of sin that causes us to be hated and to be enemies of God and even to hate ourselves, to cry out, God, why have you made me thus? It isn't God, it's Adam. The sin of Adam. It's nailed to the cross. The sin that pierced his soul is deeper than the crown of thorns on his head. So we are the silent partner. Our sin, tangibly our sin, was the silent partner standing by approving of what was done to Jesus mm -hmm. because that sin doesn't want to be redeemed. Mm -hmm. But yet God the Father reached out and drew us no man comes to the Father except the Spirit draw him. Drew us 
to the bleeding side of Christ to cleanse us from the power of sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Father, we thank you. Lord, we want to be born again again. We want to be cleansed. We want to have an acknowledgement of that living thing in us that is culpable in the death of Christ. That part that you paid a price to cleanse from our lives. God, we know that even as believers, there's still a wrestling that Romans 7 talks about. I know that John Wesley believed that that could be completely expurgated from our character. God, if that's possible, that, that even the original germ of sin in our physical bodies could be removed. Lord, I don't know if that's good theology, but I sure appreciate the sentiment. That, that that thing in us that holds blood guiltiness for the death of the cross could be so ejected from our character that when you look upon us, not just in reckoning, but in substance, you'd see nothing but that of the character of your son. Oh, God. Like Paul, we cry out that we might be apprehended by that for which we have been apprehended for, that your nature and your character would so capture us that like Jesus said, the prince of this world would come and he said, I just can't sift and find anything in that person I can work with. Yes, my God. We thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father.